Well, maybe let's get started and hope that uh, the rest of our panelists come in the next minute or two. Um, good morning, good afternoon, and I suppose for some it's it's good evening. Um, my name is Christina Rambaitis Del Rio. I work with the Global Commission on Adaptation and the World Resources Institute. And it's my pleasure to, to moderate today's um, session on putting money where it matters. Um, Shahil, if we could just have the slides up for, for a second. I have a, a few housekeeping uh, announcements to make, um, but we're really delighted to have this, um, this session and, and have such great attendance for, for this session. If you could go to the next slide. Um, in this session, which is part of the climate finance theme, we're going to be talking about putting money where it matters. And, um, Really, this is motivated by a couple of really important pieces of research that have come out recently. Um, one is that we'll be hearing about is from the Zurich Flood Resilience Alliance um, and some work done by Concern Worldwide and Mercy Corps showing that funding for climate change adaptation isn't being targeted um, to the most climate vulnerable countries. Um, we also know from work done by IIED in 2017 that very little money, 10% uh, or less, is being targeted for work at the local level. Um, we don't know how much of that money is actually even being delivered um, and where the decision making lies and whether or not local communities have um, agency and, and decision making power over those resources. So we, we know this is a situation that needs to change. And in this session, we're going to be talking not just about describing the problem, um, but really looking at solutions, looking at what we can do together as a community of, of practice um, to, to address these issues. Uh, we know it won't be immediate and we'll take, take some time. Um, so to kick us off, I'll go through the, the agenda, but I just want to say if you, um, to the, all the participants, if you want to introduce yourselves on the chat box, please go ahead, tell us who you are, tell us where you're joining from. Um, this is a, a relatively small group, um, and so it's great to be able to get to know each other. Um, so please, please do that. So we're going to start the session with a, a hard talk. Um, uh, a conversation with some some panelists, uh, Sally Til Tildesley from Concern Worldwide, Sheila Patel from Sun Dwellers International, and Marek Sones from IIED, and then we'll go into breakout groups where we'll get to talk with each other, listen to each other, share ideas um, um, around uh, advocacy messages um, to address this issue, as well as principles for locally led action that have been developed under the locally led adaptation action track of the Global Commission on Adaptation that we want to co-create with you and, and, and develop further with, with your input. Um, we're going to have cartoonists with us for these conversations um, throughout today's session. And you might be wondering why on earth would we have cartoonists for a session on climate finance? Um, and there's very good reason for that. I'm, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague uh, Bettina to tell us, to introduce us to the cartoonists and tell us a little bit more about that. Bettina, over, over to you. Right. Thank you, Christina. Um, so if you can see me, um, maybe you can stop screen share for a moment. Yeah. And um, I can ask. Yes, great. Um, and I'd like to say, think a little bit about what is important and what we have been talking for um, about for quite a long time. And we would like to give you a bit of a sense of what we can do differently as we talk in this session. So you can see here is a cartoon that we have uh, that is a result of a cartoonathon that gives us a different perspective and maybe something not super unfamiliar, but um, important to be said to um, really say giving up power to local led locally led action is sometimes tricky and sometimes difficult so cartoons allow us to really put our finger 
on the pulse, say things that maybe we would like to say clearly, um, things that we find challenging, things that we find incongruous, things that we find uh, need attention. So we would really like to invite you to be as candid as possible in your breakout groups, in your discussions, to give the cartoon artists um, a good idea of what you think really matters and what we need to put in these cartoons. That we have three cartoon artists here with us, Clive, Betje and Irene. Um, welcome so much to all of you. Um, they will be listening throughout the session and they will be drawing sketch cartoons throughout the session based on what you're saying. Hopefully really giving us a new perspective on some of the aspects that they pick up they have full um, freedom, artistic freedom to do so. We will then share the drafts at the end of the session um, today. So um, you'll be able to comment on their drafts. Tell us how you feel. Is this right? Is this spot on? Is there something missing? And uh, then following the session, they will complete two drafts each. And of course, we'll share the final um, cartoons with you. You're also welcome to use them, of course, for promoting your work going forward. And I think that is it, Christina. Thank you. Thanks, Bettina. Yeah, so a really exciting twist. I think it, it, I've been part of this uh, just recently, and it, it, it gives a different perspective and a different flavor to conversations. and causes great uh, reflection um, and sometimes a little bit of pain and discomfort as you grapple with some of the tensions that that come out. Um, if I could ask for the slides to go back up, we have just a few housekeeping rules um, that that I need to go through. Um, first, that the session is, is being recorded. Um, if you could go to the next slide. Um, so the session is being recorded. Um, we hope everyone is okay with that and aware of that. Um, we um, also ask that, um, that you turn off things like Skype, um, which can sometimes be distracting or interfere with the bandwidth so that we have maximum bandwidth um, for, for the session so we can see each other and talk to each other, especially in the breakout groups. Um, also, we're, we're um, very worried and have taken precautions about uh, to prevent Zoom bombing, um, which would be unwanted or uh, uninvited participants uh, and inappropriate comments. Um, so if we see anything of that nature happening, we will um, take someone out of the meeting and remove the offending um, content uh, immediately. Um, so. So that's uh, just so everyone's aware of that. And I guess the last thing is, um, please don't share the link to this meeting. We, we're already at our cap, and so we're not able to, to add in additional participants, and we don't want any Zoom bombing, which uh, tends to happen when people share links on social media. Um, so that's it in terms of housekeeping. Um, I think, Aditya, we're going to go over to you for the hard talk session. And uh, if you could take the screen off, the slides off. Thanks. Great, thank you, Christina. Climate change is a global problem created by the rich and the powerful, but a passionate band of advocates from across the world is now claiming that developing countries and poor communities should be put in the driver's seat for founding, finding solutions for its impacts. My name is Aditya Bahadur, and I'm over the next 20 minutes, I'm going to lead this hard talk session for the ABC, the Adaptation Broadcasting Corporation, and grill these advocates about why they believe what they believe and ask them to defend their ridiculous positions. Starting with Sally. Sally, you work with Concern Worldwide. You're part of the Zurich Flood Resilience Alliance. And I have seen you in other sessions across uh, this conference claiming that countries that need money for adaptation the most are not getting it. Do you have any data to back up this bold claim? Thanks for your question, Aditya. Um, so I would say yes. Um, in doing analysis for the report, we used the very best available data. So we use the adaptation funding data that donor countries and multilaterals are themselves reporting. And what that data is telling us is that the most climate vulnerable countries are not receiving preferential targeting for adaptation funding. So when we looked at bilateral donors, 
Um, 18 out of 26 have never provided more than half of their adaptation funding to the most climate vulnerable countries. And then when it comes to multilaterals, less than 50% of approved and dispersed adaptation financing from the main multilateral climate funds like the GCF and Adaptation Fund and the GF target the most vulnerable. So there's no correlation between money received for climate change adaptation per capita, people living in extreme poverty and the climate vulnerability of a country. Um, but in terms of the, the data, I think there is it's slightly more complicated in that we do have the right data to be able to make these claims, but there's also a lot of room for improvement in reporting and data. And I think it's important to really strive towards improved data for transparency, accountability and understanding, um, particularly where improved data can encourage you know, more and also better access to funding for the most climate vulnerable countries and marginalized groups. Um, but I think that that's sort of a side issue to that underlying one that the report highlights, that there just isn't enough adaptation funding generally, um, and that it's not being targeted at the most climate vulnerable countries. Sally, but isn't the problem that, um, isn't the fact that these countries, they're not getting the money because they don't have the systems and the capacity to spend this money wisely and really make an impact at the ground level. If tomorrow they were to get all the money that they need, will they be able to spend it wisely? Well, I don't think that because something is difficult, it means that it shouldn't be done. Um, so I'd acknowledge that adaptation in some of the most climate vulnerable countries is challenging. Uh, so many of the countries include fragile and conflict affected contexts. Um, but I'd argue that that isn't a sufficient an excuse. Uh, so we know that adaptation can be done in these countries. And what we need is really a concerted effort to embed the leave no one behind principle in the global climate finance architecture. Um, otherwise, people will be left behind or, or be kept behind by the, the kind of current system. Uh, so last week, the OECD came out of their latest um, states of fragility report, and that highlighted that this year, fragile contexts were home to 23% of the world's population, um, and 76.5% of those living in extreme poverty. Um, and over the last decade, the gap between the most fragile countries and non-fragile countries increase every year. Climate change is only going to exacerbate these existing fragilities and, and put the SDGs further out of reach for those countries. Sally, lots of people claim that uh, lower middle income and middle income countries that have vast swaths of uh, vulnerable people would be able to spend the money much better rather than LDCs that show up at the higher end of global vulnerability indices. Isn't it much better for the global community to invest in the countries that can do something useful with the money? I guess I, that comes down to the, the sort of logic that we want to use in terms of where we put our money. Um, where the global um, climate finance does tra travel. And I think um, it comes down to what I just said in terms of um, applying that leave no one behind principle, which is a kind of one of the underlying principles of the Sustainable Development Goals and Agenda 2030. Um, and if we don't really target the LDCs and those most climate vulnerable countries, uh, we're, we're gonna leave these people behind um, and I think really that's that's something that we need to address in the system. I'm going to go back to the studio and check if our second guest, uh, Sheila Patel, uh, has entered the studio or not. Uh, Christina, back at the studio, are you able to confirm if she's able to join us now? Yes, we have a live uh, video to uh, Sheila Patel. It might just be audio due to due to transit issues. Sheila ji, I'm not sure if you can hear us. I think we're having some temporary problem with the satellite link, so we're going to go. No, no, I'm here, I'm here. Oh, Sheila Ji has joined us. Thank you, Sheila Ji. Uh, the oh. question for you is that you have been a passionate advocate for local action on adaptation, but don't mm -hmm. we need bold international and national policies to move the needle on resilience? Isn't this problem far too great? And should we not be looking at higher levels of governance for this? See, I, uh, I was listening to the conversation that you had with the previous speaker, and I want to bring up three issues instead of 
simply saying yes, no, okay to your question. The first thing is, whether you're talking about LDCs or you're talking about middle-income countries, there are different reasons why they are unable to reach the poor. So as a person who lives and works with both middle-income countries with large swathes of very poor people as well as some LDC countries, the reasons for not reaching out to the poor are different. But in all instances, across all countries, there is serious non-absorption of whatever money is already there. And I think we have to start from that. You know, big, bold, uh, overarching global discussions do not address the serious granular political disenfranchisement and exclusive traditions that allow money to remain unutilized, which is there. So we accept that the money that is there is little, but even if that is unutilized, that's the first thing that you have to address. But Sheila Ji, sorry to interrupt, uh, but yeah. in the spirit of hard talk, can we push yeah. back on that? Since you are yeah. agreeing that uh, some of yeah. the countries who need money for adaptation yeah. most are unable to yeah. utilize it, that's precisely the point that we're trying to make. Shouldn't it go to people who can use it better and more quickly? I don't know how many can use it better and quickly. Because even today, if you take uh, the Life AR project, it's taken a lot of negotiations for the countries to agree that 70% of the money that they will get, they will do, they will do it with local adaptation, with locally led action. It's taken a long negotiation. So I think what you negotiate, who you bring into the table to make designs. I think you are, we have to do many things in different places. One thing at a time is not going to do it. And COVID has exacerbated all this and given all our countries very good reasons not to invest in the most vulnerable once more. So I also want to put that into your hard talk pot because many of right. our countries are saying that the GDPs are going down, aid is going down, this is going down. But that all of them are scot-free when they don't utilize the money that they have. And there should be a, just as we have, uh, uh, we, we say that the climate, change, climate fund has not utilized the money that it has. Across the board, if you take most of the bilateral and multilateral institutions and national government allocations, they are not being utilized in the social sectors. Right. So but Shilaji, I can't help done. feel... I can't help feel that you're evading my first question, which is no, you've I'm been not. a passionate you've been a passionate advocate for action at the local level. But don't we need big bank, global, and regional solutions to this problem? Yeah, yeah, we do, but it requires a different architecture, which is what I'm trying to tell you. That just saying, you know, I, I I'm happy to make those bold statements, but I have an accountability to a constituency that wants that money and doesn't have mechanisms that help them get it. So if you don't look at the granular issues along with these bold big things, then we are still back to square one. So in the new normal, we have to be able to link the global with the granular in ways that we have never done. I want to know how many people who talk globally about money are ready to sit in the same room in the same table with leaders of social movements and design the architecture of that change. If anybody Chile, in is ready to of, do that, we'll be, yeah. In the spirit of granularity, <laughs> give us yeah. one tangible example of what do you mean by a mechanism that will help people at the local level spend money for adaptation effectively? Okay. Uh, let's take the whole issue of uh, uh, let's take two or three issues. One is the whole campaign for sanitation. Okay, it is critical that in this day and age, we don't have water-based sanitation, which is often the basis for which poor neighborhoods don't get water and sanitation. But the rest of the city is still doing a 200 year old mechanism. So we need new technology, we need everybody to learn new things. We need to do everything. And there are so many examples of this which have not been scaled up. Right, right. So I think I'm just saying you can take any example. You take public transport. Why is it today 
when we all know that maximum utilization of public transport right. should be the first thing. Yet every country that I know spends more money on roads for private cars than it does on public transport. That's a great so take, example. Uh, you, you we'll come back to you in a minute. But okay. We'll come back to you in a minute, Sheila Ji. Um, yeah. uh, another one of our guests, uh, Marek Sones, is joining us via satellite link as well. I've seen okay. him talk very boldly about making sure that finance gets to the local level. We should put money where it matters. Where uh, uh, that and by that he specifically means vulnerable communities. Marek, by that, aren't you simply asking people who've contributed least to the problem to lead the charge in finding solutions for it? Oh, uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here this morning with Sally and, Sally and Sheila, as, Sheila well. as well, and to uh, that's a really good question. It's a pleasure to ask, answer it. Well, I would certainly say that when we're not advocating for the burden just simply to be, to be passed from international and national actors to local people, because that wouldn't be just. However, what we are advocating for at IID is for local people to have more power, more agency and more resources to firstly participate meaningfully and but also to be able to lead their own adaptation and development where it makes sense. And this is an imperative because it's the failure to do this that has put us in this crisis that we face where only a few selected people and corporations are reaping the benefits. And let's be clear, uh, some evidence from IID is actually showing, for instance, in Bangladesh, that we've all, the burden's already been passed and we need to be rebalancing the tables, in fact. So households seem to be spending about up to twice national governments and 12 times international governments already on responding to climate and disaster risk. So the burden's already been passed it's about rebalancing the tables. So the poor are already proportionally spending the most to address the crisis, yet are being given the least support to help them. Uh, the poor are then prevented from being act, uh, accessing and controlling the resources, the services uh, to help them to have control over how their development takes place. And it's not only a question of uh, distribution law and procedural justice, also there's huge amounts of effectiveness that Sheila has already alluded to the fact that they can deliver more context specific uh, interventions in sitting in London or in another Western headquarter. We're never going to know exactly how the climate is changing on the ground versus the people who deal with these climate changes on a day to day basis that have more links and associations with the natural resources that they depend upon for their livelihoods. Uh, and also we need more agile and diverse solutions if we just focus on one big global or a few big global solutions and that one and that solution fails we're left in a real dire situation rather than many small distributed solutions that creates more redundancy that if one fails we've got lots of others to pick up where we left off and obviously i've just mentioned the fact that evidence from bangladesh shows that households are already spending more so it's about supplementing and supporting those local solutions not marginalizing them but maybe just to be clear I'm not advocating that all action should happen at the local level. We need collaborative responses from across society with the public sector, private sector, civil society across from that international to the local level. But it's about rebalancing those tables, about giving local people more of a voice in what happens and also unlocking their potential, the innovation that they have. But if we don't, even if local action isn't always the most effective place for it to happen, if local people aren't strongly involved, then interventions are likely to be either less effective or more likely to do harm. So if you take, for instance, climate information services, uh, we know that we need international and national organizations to have a really strong role because they need the supercomputers, they need the meteorologists, the physicists that really understand how this system works. It's really complex. But if you provide that information and you just provide it to smallholder farmers or local people to use it's and you don't develop it in a participatory way and give them a clear role and power in helping it work it's going to fail they're not going to be able to use it it's not going to be able to work for them it's not going to be able to deal with the complexities or the power dynamics in their local communities so yeah i hope that so mark yeah. you've used a lot of big words to confuse us you've talked <laughs> about agile systems you've talked about balancing the tables you've talked about participatory development what does this all mean in practice? Tell us, how do you really make sure that communities who are the receiving end of climate change 
have the right implements and tools to respond. Sure. So thanks to you for that question. I think that also nicely really builds on a couple of the tricky questions you were posing to Sally and Sheila as well about uh, do they have the mechanisms in place to really do this? Why don't we just invest in national systems because their systems are better? Or why don't we just invest in international intermediaries because we think they have the capacities to respond? And I think it's really important that we, firstly, that we really recognize that local people, as I said, have a lot of traditional, generational, indigenous knowledge that is absolutely crucial to unlock. It's not that other expertise is more important. It's about recognizing that local expertise is just as important as the expertise in, that we value in the West. Um, but also that we, there are a host of mechanisms that already exist, Sheila alluded to some in the urban context, that, that can already be leveraged to get finance effectively to local people behind their priorities. So we commonly hear these issues from big donors that uh, it's, too, it's too financially risky or it's too hard to deliver at scale. And then there's that common question of maybe local people don't have those capabilities and they will invest in their immediate needs rather than strategic needs. But it's about also thinking, well, do, can we provide the finance on the right terms to local people that they feel they can take some risks, they can feel trusted to shift the way and shift their investment horizons, but also that they're linked to the capabilities of national actors, to sectoral experts, to merge that local and traditional knowledge right. with that scientific expertise. Yeah. In, in finally, the final question to you, Marek, given half a chance, I've always seen the IIED team jumps to bang on about some principles of locally led adaptation. <laughs> what, what are these principles and why should we take them seriously? You have one minute to answer. So one quick minute then. So, so yeah, so thanks for mentioning that. So what we've observed is that we really need to try and shift the way that international intermediaries, global climate funds, donors are helping build this new business unusual financial ecosystem that the LBCs are aiming for, that support the civil society funding mechanisms, uh, decentralization, social protection, all these approaches that can really get funding to the local level. So we've been setting out uh, several principles, and I think we might be discussing them today that we think could actually shift this up. And um, maybe we're not doing enough, but that's what we want to hear from. So it's increasing the devolution of finance, that fi more finance is decided as close to the people that experience the impacts, that have the local knowledge to respond, that we are investing in institutions so that actually can do the job that donors are currently doing into the future. If we're not creating these institutions, how are we actually going to be delivering resilience in the long term? Uh, we're doing radical transparency, like Sally referred to, that we're actually donors and aid agencies and intermediaries are telling us how much funding is actually getting to the local levels. So we can hold them account accountable because at the moment it's almost impossible. That we're putting a structural inequalities like gender, disability, rights, race at the center of how we deliver, deliver resilience. So the most excluded have more power and that we're actually um, um, merging that traditional knowledge with climate science and helping local people to plan for an incredibly uncertain and an incredibly risky future that we've put upon them. And finally, uh, that the programming we help them do is really flexible. Let, let's, not, let's not pretend that sitting in London or in another donor country that we really know the solutions that they really need. Right. When we set out on a project, uh, we never know what exactly is going to happen or what is going to be most effective. So we need to provide and provide local people, local actors and institutions with the flexibility to test solutions, to learn uh, how to do things, to change their direction potentially if they feel a better yeah. solution is more appropriate. Great. Sheila Ji, Marek, Sally, mm. thank you for defending your position so valiantly in the face of such skepticism. Back to the studio. You are good. <laughs> Aditya, I think you have a long future at the Adaptation Broadcasting Company. Um, thank you <laughs> to the American Sally and, and Aditya for that hard talk session. As um, Merrick just mentioned, um, under the, the um, locally led action track of the Global Commission on Adaptation, a number of, of principles have been developed. Um, if, if we could have the slides, I'll go through those briefly. And, and I should say this builds on really decades of work now um, from IIED, Huayru Commission, SDI, um, uh, LUC, uh, and ICAD, and, and many other partners that have been uh, looking at these issues. Um, 
uh, but we've worked to consolidate into eight short principles. We, we don't have time to talk about all of them today, so we're just going to go through six of them, um, and I'll go through them very quickly, but um, you'll have more time in the breakout groups to go into these more deeply. So the first principle is the issue of devolution of decision making to the lowest possible level. Um, in short, this is about getting the decision making as close as possible to the most affected communities um, and enabling them to decide what their priorities are and what should be done to, to build resilience. The second principle is about investing in local institutions and legacies. And this is really about the fact that we, we know we need local institutions, strong local institutions to respond uh, to climate challenges and other challenges that, that, that arise. As we've seen with COVID, it's the groups that are on the ground that have been there, that are trusted, that are on the front lines of the COVID response. Well, for those organizations to be there when we need them, we need to invest in them. They, they need to have core support um, and, and funding streams can't be tied uh, exclusively to projects um, if we're gonna have strong uh, institutions at the local level for, for the long term. The third um, principle we wanna talk about today is, is radical transparency. Um, and this, uh, this is one of my favorites, I have to say. Um, this is really about being able to track the money, follow it down to the local level, and understand how, how it's being used and putting communities in the driver's seat to tell us, are, is the funding being used as it should be? Um, is it building resilience? Is it building it fast enough? Is it doing it in the right way? Um, so it's really about about having the visibility into the impacts and also into the funding. Next slide. Um, the fourth principle is about addressing structural inequalities. And this is, this is really about recognizing that vulnerability is not uh, a purely technical issue or a biophysical issue. It's, it's about um, the inequalities, biases, legacies of, uh, that people face uh, in terms of discrimination against different classes, uh, ethnicities, genders, levels of ability, religion, and, and that we need to address these issues head on when we're talking about adaptation and, and resilience. Um, all too often we, we tend to ignore these issues, um, but we really need to grapple with them and, and design um, solutions that address these inequalities and, and things like access to land and, and resource rights and tenure rights as well. Fifth principle is about building robust understanding of climate risks and uncertainty. Um, so climate change is, is in inherently uncertain, um, that's for sure, um, but we know we need to build robust, robust solutions to a variety of climate futures. And that means thinking long-term, that means thinking about um, compounded risks, that means um, also using traditional knowledge and traditional um, ecological knowledge to help inform the, the development of solutions. Um, that often that, that knowledge and that capacity is already there and will help us build more, more robust solutions. And then the last principle that we'll be discussing today is on flexible programming. Um, all too often, funds are very carefully um, tied to different outputs um, that are meant to be delivered, and there's not a lot of flexibility to, to change course if you learn that something isn't working and, and need to try something else, or um, conditions change and you radically need to, to change your, your programming. There really needs to be greater flexibility to enable learning and enable adaptation to, to happen in practice. So these are some of the principles um, that, that we want to discuss with you today. We want you to tell us, um, do they make sense? Um, will they work? Have you seen it work in practice? What, it, what would make it work? Um, uh, and, and is there anything missing um, in what we've presented here? Next slide. So we're going to be moving into four breakout groups. Um, great great <laughs> breakout group one, that was a tongue twister for me, 
we'll focus on, on advocacy questions. Um, so really building off of the report um, that the Zurich Flood Resilience Alliance has put forward and, and some of the reports and evidence that we've heard about, what are some of the concrete actions that, that we should be advocating for donors to take? Um, how do we ensure that that's not just uh, rhetoric and that we move from rhetoric to action? What are some of the barriers and opportunities for getting more funding to, to vulnerable countries? Um, and then what are the real world impacts of not funding adaptation? Um, what story, compelling stories do we have to, to really build that sense of urgency in our advocacy messages? Um, and so I'm gonna say for all the breakout groups, um, we'll have 30 minutes. Um, we'll need to nominate someone um, not from the organizing team to report back in the plenary session. And, and really we want as many people to discuss as possible um, and to be as concrete and succinct as possible as you can as, as we only have 30 minutes. Um, next slide. So that's for breakout group one. For breakout groups two, three, and four, um, we're gonna be discussing the principles for locally led action that I, that I just briefly presented. Um, and we want you to focus on, is this principle important? Do you think it would address some of the roadblocks preventing locally led adaptation that we just heard about in, in the hard talk session? Um, if, if not, what could be improved about it? How would, you, how would you put it differently? How would you make it stronger? Um, what does this principle mean for you in practice? Um, do you have any experience operationalizing it? What worked, what didn't? Um, and what's one concrete thing that you would do to help achieve um, the spirit of this principle? So those are, those are the questions. Um, we're gonna have rapporteurs taking notes uh, on a document really verbatim, notes on what is said. We'll also be recording the breakout groups. And then the cartoonists are gonna be dipping in and out of our conversations, um, spying on us, if you will, uh, and reflecting back what, what they hear and what um, they see as some of the, the key points, tensions that, um, that emerge in discussion. Um, so Margo, I believe you're gonna send us into to breakout groups automatically and magically. Yeah, that's right. So um, the breakout groups are ready. Um, in a moment, you should see a pop-up screen that says um, you're invited to join breakout group number one, two, three, or four. If you can click on that, then you'll zoom in automatically and we'll bring you back at the end of it. So I'm going to open them right now. Great. Have a good talk, everyone. Great. I think we're all back in, in plenary. Um, we have a, a little bit of time for report back. So I'm gonna, I'm sure people had much more to say um, and, and probably were very frustrated when they were brought back. Um, so what I will do is we'll go through each group, have a two minute or so report back, and then we're gonna see what um, our, our cartoonist friends have, have been up to um, during this time. Um, so Sally, maybe to go to your group first, do you have a, a, a person identified to report back? Uh, we, we do have a very lucky person, uh, Adriana, I think, uh, is going to give a bit of a summary of our discussions. Yeah, hi everyone, happy to um, report back from the advocacy group. Um, so there were a lot of really interesting points made and just to recap, um, the discussion focused on concrete actions that donors should be taking, um, opportunities and barriers for getting funding to the most vulnerable and some of the real world impacts of not funding adaptation. So I think the group kind of coalesced around a few key points. So first donors need to provide a quick delivery of funding. Um, the Green Climate Fund and Adaptation Fund were flagged as examples of um, how this doesn't always go well. So the funding decisions tend to take a lot of time. And um, in that time, the context may change, which means that funding may be um, not as effective as it was if there was a more quick release of funding. Um, we also discussed that some of the concrete actions that can be taken is to consider is for donors to consider um, maybe being less risk averse and being open to learning from projects that might fail. So donors are not always keen to take on risky projects, but they also want innovation. 
Um, so if donors are more open to taking on more risk, uh, that can present a real learning opportunity to see what works um, and maybe what doesn't to help shape new initiatives and projects. Um, COVID-19 was um, shown as an example of how immense amounts of funding can be mobilized under urgent conditions, and it would be good to look at whether these channels can be tapped to ensure a quick delivery of climate finance. Um, another point that was mentioned was the inclusion of youth voices and how um, youth are often brought into conversations but are not really heard or, you know, there aren't uh, meaningful attempts to listen to what they have to say, so how we can address that. Um, and then finally, um, speeding up processes on the ground um, to make sure that the most vulnerable can be reached. So once we do, once we are able to channel climate finance, um, there are longer processes for formalizing groups, trying to get multi-stakeholder alliances together. And that does take time. So how can we maybe speed up that process so we can get um, projects in place to really deliver um, for the most vulnerable? So yeah, I would say those were some of the key points that were mentioned. Thanks, Adriana. That's, that's great. It's definitely some themes uh, in common with what we discussed in breakout group two. Um, I got so excited about being breakout group, I forgot to designate a person to report back. So Peter has, has graciously um, agreed to do that, um, especially since he got cut off on his last point. So Peter, maybe over to you. Oh, I'm, I'm not sure if I can report back in the whole session, but I could recap my last point. Yeah, go for it. I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of what okay, we said. Right. I mean, so the whole discussion on, 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 on trust and risk, and I was just sort of recapping from my own experience, I think that funders, they want to have as much information as possible. They want the return on their investment. It just happens to be that at the beginning of a project cycle, that's when you have to make the most important decisions normally, because that's what the funder requires from you, but it's also the time when you have the least information. So I think there's really a big need for you know, to explain, to have, a, to, to have donors understand that um, you cannot have that full clarity, but they get a, a better return, they get better, uh, higher climate outcomes if we, um, if we sort of postpone those decisions and let the communities decide. So um, I, I think once you, have, once, you, um, once you have that sort of common understanding, it's, it's, it's easier to, for the donor to accept the risk. Yeah. Over to you. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Yeah, so our, our group was discussing this issue of, of risk and how do we grapple with the risk that donors face, the risk that communities face, and, and, and really build trust in that context. And I, I just want to draw out a, something that Sheila said um, in our group that the biggest risk is doing nothing. And I think that's a, that's a good reminder to all of us. That's, that's what got us into this situation. Um, and so while we look to build trust, while we look to devolve decision making and, and build local institutions, we need to keep in, in mind that uh, the bigger risk is, is doing nothing. Um, I'll stop there unless anyone else from group two wants to add any key points. If not, I'll go to group three. Who's, who's reporting back for group three? Great. We're going to ask Lou Bega to lead the charge and then Barry will supplement. Right. Thank you very much. Um, uh, some of the points that we came up with, uh, we're looking at, uh, of course, uh, the, the transparency and how uh, account accountability can be handled and the trust from the grassroots or from the communities until the international level or to the donors. And uh, one of the points that we looked at is the structural inequality, whereby uh, you find that there are those kind of uh, uh, gaps within the structures of the uh, community or com uh, community-based organizations. There are those kind of uh, gaps into the structure and eventually we end up trusting the government, which really at the end of the day fails to work for us. So there is building of the capacity of the community-based organizations to be in position to, 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 to be part of the decision-making kind of body. Then uh, what the point of gender equity and inequality, uh, it is also a very strong one whereby uh, uh, you might find that some of the resources are allocated in um, a certain project not 
putting this into um, into play, not thinking that probably we need to, to look at other factors around it. Then uh, we also looked at the flexibility of the funds that, that are supposed to go. If they are to reach the ground, there should be that flexibility such that we can, uh, we can adopt different measures and different principles as we are moving forward. Um, then uh, we also looked at the cooperation. There should be that cooperation between the local organization or community-based organization and the international organizations as well, um, the NGOs. And also we say we should put uh, the local solutions onto the front line, uh, local solutions uh, that come up, projects that come from the community-based organizations, for example, those that are, especially those that are looking at climate change and adaptation, the likes of uh, waste management, uh, recycling, bricket making, urban farming, uh, among others, so you should put them on the front line and also look at grassroots as partners other than looking at them as beneficiaries. Uh, that's when we shall be in position to have them on the round table and make sure that they are part of the decision making. So we do a lot of uh, community contracting, uh, the community collaboration, so that the community knows how much is coming, how much is going to be uh, put in on which project, so they are part of the decision making body. That's, uh, those are some of the points we came up with, but uh, of course someone from my group can also add on some points. Over to you. Thank you, Lubega. Barry, do you want to take 10 seconds to add any critical points? That yeah, yeah. It's just to say, uh, on the point of radical transparency, there is a there's a sort of subtext underneath it where there is going to be a, some donor nervousness around radical transparency because there is often sort of poor accountability in developing countries. And I think the example that the fragile states was given, and putting money into the the public financial management system can be ri risky, and there, you know there is issues of corruption and being siphoned off at certain points. So that, that, needs, that does need to be considered. However, having an effective tracking methodology uh, would, would, I guess, uh, assuage some of those concerns, I think. Um, that was something that was definitely raised in our group. Great. Thanks, Barry. And I just want to highlight that there's a session later today that will be talking more deeply about the issue of transparency and accountability um, a session on MEL um, for locally led action uh, later, later today, for those of you who are interested. Um, we're really short on time, so I'm going to go quickly to group four, because um, I want to leave time to see the cartoons and, and, and discuss those a bit. So group four, over. over Hi there. Hi, I'm Olivia. I'm reporting back for group four, but please do jump in, anyone else from group four, if I miss anything. Um, so we covered two uh, the two areas, the climate, um, uh, I suppose the climate reality on the ground and climate data um, and the flexible funding. Um, from the climate data side of things, um, we had some really great examples from, um, from colleagues in Bangladesh, uh, Malawi, um, I had some um, experience in Cape Town. Um, and I'm just going to read a couple of things from the notes. Um, so Sharon from Bangladesh, um, she has some experience in um, doing community risk management um, and they used like a timeline exercise where they were measuring um, how uh, cyclones, the intensity of cyclones had changed over decades um, with, the, with communities. Um, and we had other... Olivia, I'm going to ask you to be really brief. Okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, and uh, then on the flexible funding side of things, um, we were talking about, oh, sorry, uh, one important point for the climate data was that we needed governments to um, give that data legitimacy, uh, not just governments, but NGOs and everyone else as well, because if the data is not considered legitimate, then it's, um, you know, it, it's not, uh, we're not giving it, it, the communities the power to produce that data. Um, on the flexible funding side of things, we talked about, um, uh, sorry, complete mind blank. Um, one headline point and then, uh, okay. I'm sorry. It's the point I made, but it was about, um, allowing projects to fail uh, or not allowed, but not demonizing projects for failing. Yeah. Um, and ensuring that if mistakes are made, it's not, it doesn't sort of prevent new ideas from happening. future funding. Yeah. Yeah. Great, thank you for that. And sorry to, to, to <laughs> off and put you no under the 
Um, next, I want to hand over to, to Bettina, who's going to take us through the cartoon art, artist's work, and, and we'll hear from the cartoonists themselves who have been busy at work this whole time. Um, Bettina, maybe over to you. Thank you so much. Yes, and without further ado, the um, cartoonists have been very stressed and have been listening well and have been friendly drawing. You, you maybe have felt the energy in the background. Um, we uploaded them in the Google Doc. You can see, navigate to the Google Doc that I put in the chat. Um, and if you scroll down past the discussion points, you see a red bar that says cartoon gallery. This is the gallery with the drafts that we have so far. Um, we'll be adding to it as you look at them in the next couple of minutes. Please have a look at the cartoons and first and foremost, enjoy them. And then it would be really super if you can also add a couple of thoughts on does this cartoon resonate with you? What do you think? Is there something missing? Is it, is it infuriating you? Do you think it's uh, missing the point? Do you think it's spot on? Give us some comments and some feedback. We'd really like that. And uh, with the comments and the feedback, the cartoon artists will then, after the session, will go back and finish two of these cartoons and um, we share it with all of you. So please, in the meantime, add some comments. This is a Google Doc. Please do not delete any comments, even if you don't agree with them. Just write another one to state your point. We'd really appreciate to hear from you. Five minutes we have for this, maybe six. So if you can be... Uh, sure that you look at all the cartoon drafts um, and pause at those that speak to you to add your comments. Enjoy this and uh, when we are coming to a close we'll hear from the cartoon artists a brief reflection on how this experience was for them and uh, yeah enjoy the cartoons for now. Bettina tell us again how to get there I missed that. There is a there is a link here I put it again in the chat. Ah, okay. Can you see the chat? Yes. Um, if you can navigate there, you should come to a Google Doc. And if you scroll down um, um, past the notes of the sessions, you see a red, uh, a red cartoon gallery. That's where they start. Uh, okay. Got it. Super. Super. Thanks, Sheila. Mm. And while we are reflecting, we can see some comments coming in. Thank you so much for those who are um, sharing um, your thoughts. Um, make sure you scroll all the way down to all the cartoons that are there. Um, and uh, yes, we'll be sharing the final cartoons. And as long as you credit the artists and the and cartoon collections, um, you'll be able to use it for non-profit work, especially, of course, if it is linked and only if it is linked to the local and action um, interests. So, uh, of course, we'll share them with you, Jesse. Um, the final one. So these are just drafts. Um, we'll share the final versions that have everything um, on them that need to be uh, there to be able to use them more widely. couple more minutes to jot down your comments, make sure you look at all the cartoons and hopefully enjoy them.
Great, thank you um, so much. Please feel free to still comment until the end of the session in six minutes, but uh, I would like to give a minute to um, Irene, Irene, if you are online. Um, Irene is one of the cartoon artists. The first couple of cartoons are from Irene. Um, Irene, would you like to share with us um, some thoughts? How was this process for you? Yeah, it's always, uh, as I always say, <laughs> It gives some pressure to jump uh, from a conversation to another to grasp uh, what's important. And I try to listen to what participants say, say just very spontaneously, how can I say, and, um, and see if something is useful for making a, a comic, which is, yeah, I try to be not too cynical, but <laughs> sometimes it's what, uh, uh, gives more reflections about the topic. <laughs> thank you, Elena. But thank right. you. I love to see your comments under the, the comics. It's really useful also, also for me as a comic strip uh, artist. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Elena. Excellent. Betia, your first cartoonathon. Um, how was it for you? And any reflections very briefly that you'd like to share with us? And maybe we can pin Betty. Betty, you're on mute. You can unmute yourself and uh, come on. To yeah, the it was uh, yeah. A 90 minutes that went by very fast because it's listening and thinking and drawing and still trying to listen. It's, it was a lot, but I had a lot of fun and I learned a lot. Um, so yeah, I, I, I thought it was a great experience. I hope you like the comics. Thank you. I already see some amazing uh, comments under the under the the cartoons. I think we have some clear favorites here coming up. Um, and last but not least, Clive. We had a couple of technical difficulties. Your cartoons are still coming. Um, what is your reflection? <laughs> uh, she was quite right. The time did go past very very quickly. Um, despite all the hard talk at the beginning. I was amazed just how much consensus and agreement there was amongst everyone, especially in the breakout room. There was virtually no conflict. And if, if this could be translated into action, it'd be marvelous. Great, thank you so much, Clive. So let's see if these cartoons also can support your call to action. I'd like to thank the cartoon artists um, so much for their pressures. Please keep the comments going. We can still maybe leave this Google Doc open for another 10 minutes or so after the session. And uh, I think in order to honor time, I want to say thank you so much. Um, I hope you can use them in the work. We will share them with you and I'll hand over to Christina. Thank you. Great, thanks. Thanks, Bettina. Yes, um, we, we will definitely share the cartoons. There will be minutes from, from this meeting. We'll take all the information that the rapporteur has gathered and do do a summary of key points. So rest assured you will get that information. Um, also, I'll pop my email and, um, and, and Merrick, if you could do the same. Um, if you want a copy of the principles for locally led action, please contact us. We, we'd love to get more feedback on them. We really didn't have time to go in depth in all of them uh, today, but we, we really want this process to to involve anyone who wants to be, who is interested and want to be engaged in this. We want your thoughts, we want your feedback to help make these uh, principles much stronger. Our plan is to release a, a revised version in November and, and get adoption of these principles and announcements for the Climate Adaptation Action Summit, which will be held, um, hosted by the Government of Netherlands on January 25th, 2021, uh, with a high level event on locally led action that, that will be um, itself hosted by the, the government of, of Bangladesh. Um, and I just want to say thank you to, to everyone who helped organize this, um, to our volunteer extraordinaire, Shohail from ICAD, um, to Sally and Anne and Adriana, Aditya, Isha, Bettina, Merrick, Margot, um, to our cartoonists, Irene, Clive, and, and Betia. Um, it, it, it was fantastic, and I really appreciate all the hard work that went into this session. And most of all, the participants, um, you guys were, were fabulous. So thank you for, 
for engaging throughout the session. And uh, yeah, we look forward to, to continued dialogue, whether it's on Whova or email or um, wherever we can find each other. Um, I'm sure that the conversation will continue. So with that, I'll yep. say thank you very much. Maybe Christina, just to add, yeah, again, thank you very much. I popped my email in the chat, but yeah, as Christina said, don't hesitate to get in touch. We have actually also uh, on the Skillshare section, I think, of the Whova app, and also yeah. there's a chat, there's a chat, one of the chat boxes that we have done uh, is also on these principles. So if you have any other thoughts, please don't hesitate to also put them in those functions on the app or just send Christina and myself an email. Uh, we'd love to continue to hear from you. And yeah, great. Thank you everyone for, for participating and everyone involved. It was a great session. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Bye everyone. Bye. Thanks everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.